Okay, let's uh, go to Mark chapter 10 this morning. We are doing a series of messages entitled Life-Changing Opportunities with Jesus, and today we're going to talk about a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity. We started last week, and we talked, of course, about uh, the Lord uh, encountering the leper, and he was healed. And this morning we're going to begin in chapter 10 and read just a few verses, verses 17 through 22. 17 through 22. And the scripture says there, And as he was setting out on his journey, talking about Jesus, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? For no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Verse 20, and he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at, at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures, treasure in heaven and come follow me, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. <clears throat> so, these life-changing opportunities, and this morning we see this one, about a guy who pretty much has everything anybody would want, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But these life-changing uh, opportunities come before us, all of us, on a regular basis, God gives us the opportunity to be transformed, to be conformed, to be changed for his glory, to be used for his glory. And sometimes, uh, you know, we kind of miss them, and sometimes we don't miss them, we just ignore them. But uh, we mentioned last week, and I want to go back there for a second, uh, a verse right here in verse 45 of chapter 10, you might want to mark it in your Bible. We called it one of the mission statements, or mission verses of the work of Christ, and he says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. We talked about that. And then he said, and to give his life as a ransom for many, for many. And so <clears throat> keeping that in mind as we walk through these messages in the next few weeks, uh, we need to con consider and remember that the Lord is, <clears throat> uh, is in our lives. He's working in our lives. Uh, to give us opportunity to be uh, uh, used for him and to be honored, honoring to him and so on and so forth. So most of the account, encounters with Jesus that we find in Scripture ends up positively. Uh, last week we have a leper uh, who encounters Christ and he walks away healed. But this is one that we're going to see doesn't end that way. Uh, this is a missed opportunity and Matthew talks about it, Mark talks about it, and Luke talks about it. So we're going to be really kind of in all those books a little bit this morning. Uh, if you've got notes, you'll see where we're moving around. If you don't, you can jot the scriptures down as we go along. So the first thing I want us to look at this morning in verse 17 is the man himself, the guy who came. He came to Christ. It says in verse 17, as he was setting out on his journey, Jesus, a man ran up and knelt before him. So there's Jesus, he's beginning to go somewhere, and here comes this guy, runs up, and kneels before him. And so there's five things I want you to know about this guy this morning. First thing is that he was young. Matthew 19 and verse 22 tells us that he was young. This is a young man, he has come to see Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the first thing I want you to notice. The second thing I want you to notice is that he had wealth. Verse 22 in our text tells us he had great possessions. All three texts in Matthew, Mark, and, uh, and Luke talk about the fact that he was wealthy. He had wealth. He had, uh, he, had, he had his age going for him. He had money going for him. Verse 20 tells us, the third one, he had morals. He had morals. Look at verse 20. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Now, the reason I say he's had morals is because he's trying to obey the law. He's doing what is right. But we also don't notice something there. Jesus does not <clears throat> rebuke him for saying that. And so his track record must be pretty good. By the way, 
If you're keeping the commandments the best you can, that can pretty easily be verified uh, pe by people around there and so on and so forth. So he, he, he had morals. Verse 19 tells us that he was religious. He says, I have, uh, I, I, you know the commandments. And of course, he responds saying, yes, uh, you know, he knew the commandments. And so uh, here he is, somebody who has position and power and so on and so forth. And uh, he's a Jew and religion would have taught them uh, truths uh, about uh, the Ten Commandments. So he's religious. He understands those things. He knows what Jesus is talking about it. But it's interesting here that there's something we need to notice right here in this in this portion of scripture is that religion teaches truth, but that doesn't necessarily uh, make us accept it. Lots of people sit in church on a regular Sunday uh, going through all the motions, but they don't have Jesus in their life. There are people that will act religious. In fact, if you were to go out someplace at an airport or wherever where there's a lot of people and you were to begin asking them, are you a Christian? Are you a, a Christ follower? It don't matter what terminology you use, you will find lots of people that say yes. But if you were to ask them, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? They have no clue what you're talking about, which automatically tells us they are not. And so religious, religion isn't important. It's the relationship with Christ that's important. And there's a lot of people that are religious. Uh, knowing truth. Knowing truth doesn't make us a Christian either. Okay, Just because you know the truth of what the word says doesn't make you a follower of Christ. Uh, religion and morals will not get you to heaven. You can be a moral person, you can be a religious person, and you will be lost and doomed for life away from God for eternity. It takes a relationship with Jesus. And the fifth thing I want you to notice was that he had position. Luke 18, 18 talks about that. He says he was a ruler, okay? We don't know if he was a ruler in the synagogue. We don't know if he was maybe a part of the Sanhedrin. We talked about that in the book of Matthew. But he had a position of some sort. He was wealthy. He was young. He had morals. He was religious. And he had a position, and so in most people's eyes of that day, especially uh, that would have been around him, would have said he had everything he needed to be successful, but there's something missing, uh, something that, that he is in need of. And so we call that number two, the man's problem. The man's problem. So he comes running to Jesus in verse 17, gets, kneels down before him, and then he says, and he asks Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he realizes he has a problem and he knows what the problem is. See, sometimes we don't want to know what the problem is because if we don't know what the problem is, we don't have to do anything about the problem. One of the things I've noticed uh, over the years of dealing with people and talking with people is that a lot of them will not come and sit down and talk to you because when you begin to open up what the problem is, that means they now have to be responsible for the problem. And I don't want to be responsible for the problem. And I want you to know that you're the only people that feel that way. All of us feel that way. Am I right? And so, you know, it, it, the first thing we do when we're faced with, a, when, we're, when a problem is brought to our face is we make an, uh, an excuse. We go back to Eve and we're like, uh, you know, this is what happened in Adam and the whole mess in the garden, and we make an excuse. But, you know, when you stand before Jesus, you're without excuse. And so he says here, what, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He recognizes that his problem is he does not have eternal life. Okay? So let's see what he says here. He does some things right, and he does some things wrong. So let's talk about what he does right here first, the things he does right. Verse 17, he went to Jesus. And so he goes to Jesus. That's the first thing he does right. If you're going to find uh, how to have eternal life, wouldn't you want to go to the author of eternal life? Wouldn't you want to go to the man? Okay, and so he's, he does one thing really well here, and he goes to Jesus, and he goes and he's seeking the answer from the Savior, the one who has the ability to save him. And so he does something right. Okay, but he does something else right too. In verse 17, he says he ran up, and so he knows this is urgent. He shows urgency here. This is something I need to take care of. Now, I don't care how old you are today. I want you to know if you don't have Jesus today, there's urgency. 
because nobody knows how long you're going to live. <clears throat> no, do you? Okay, nobody knows how long they're going to live, and today could be your last day. In fact, this second could be, could be your last second. So there's urgency if you don't have Christ in your life. But let me go even a step further. If you do have Christ in your life and you have sin in your life and you know you need to take care of it, there's urgency. And he knows the urgency, so he does something well here. And so uh, as some people do, they keep putting off salvation. I've had people say to me, well, I'm having fun and down the road someplace I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take care of this, but, but not today. And yet the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that, the judgment. We come face to face with Jesus. The third thing I want you to see that he does right is in verse 17, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He knew his need. He knew his need. So he goes to Jesus. He knows there's urgency and he knows he has a need. And he said, this is my need. What do I need to inherit eternal life? He, he sees that there's a problem and he knows the problem and he wants to get it fixed. He wants to take care of it. So those are things he did right. But then he also did some things wrong. So let's talk about those. It says in verse 17, what must I do? And so the first thing he did wrong was he wants to do something. He wants to do something. He as one of the first thing he got wrong was he wants to do something. And yet in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us it is not of our own doing. It's not of our ability. It is a gift from God. Amen. It's not a result of works, because if it was about us doing something, we would all be boasting, we'd be bragging, we'd be telling everybody, look what I did, okay? And so the first thing that he got wrong was he wants to do something. Do you realize that on a regular basis, when, when we talk to people who are lost, they always want, they'll say things like, it's, it's too easy, or I just don't think it could be that easy, or what can I do? Because we have this tendency as humans to want to somehow do something to make something else happen. Now, on Monday night, as we shared on Wednesday, we had uh, a gentleman in the, in the prison ministry come to Jesus, okay? And I just want to tell you, he didn't ask any of those questions. He was convicted. He knew he needed Jesus, and he was begging to come to Jesus. And I'm not kidding, and I will share that story maybe later on. But, uh, but you know, if we got the mindset that we need to do Jesus a favor, we're in trouble. And sometimes we have that mindset. So the first thing he did wrong was he wants to do something. The second thing he got wrong was he thinks it's a reward. Look what he says here. Teacher, Matthew 19, 16 tells us, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? What good deed must I do? I must have to do something. What good deed can I get to get this reward? What, what do I get for this? Re what do I give for this reward of eternal life? Aren't you glad there's nothing we can do to have eternal life? Because let me ask you this morning in honesty with yourself, what would you do? I mean, because first of all, we wouldn't even know what to do, would we? And, and how do you know how much is enough? Okay, but we know that the blood of Christ is sufficient. Amen. And we know that when he died on the cross uh, and we accept him as our personal savior, and we surrender our life to him. That as I already mentioned a couple of times this morning, there is therefore no condemnation. Praise God. We are paid in full. We are clean. And if you're a born-again believer this morning, maybe you're sitting here saying, well, you know, he should be talking about something else. You should be rejoicing in the fact that you, you have been given the greatest gift to all mankind, Jesus. <clears throat> Ephesians 2.8, of course, tells us that uh, by grace we have been saved through faith and is a gift of God. And he thinks it's a reward of something and he wants to do something. So the two things he got wrong. And so then we pick up number three. Jesus has a message for him. Jesus delivers a message to him. Verses 18 through 22. And I want us to watch as we walk through this portion because you need to understand what's really taking place here. <clears throat> so often we get too fast with scripture and we miss things. So the first thing I want you to notice in verse 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, when you first read that verse, you might get that idea of like, why did Jesus say that? That just seemed weird that Jesus, the Son of God, would say that. Well, we're going to talk about it. The first thing that Jesus points out to him is the measurement of good. Okay, this guy 
uh, calls him good. And Jesus is like, let's get the measurement of good. Let's figure out what is good. And so Jesus tells him, basically, the only thing that's good is God. But there's a veiled picture here that he is telling that I am God. That's what's happening here, okay? He, he wants him to see, first of all, that God is the only one perfect. God is the only one that's able to save. God is the only one that's willing and able to give that perfect gift. God is the only one, but at the same time, he is giving a, a, a revelation here to this young man that he is, uh, that he is God. He says, uh, why do you call me good? He's asking the question because he wants the guy to think, what qualifies me? Since the only one that can be good is God, what qualifies me to be good? And the answer is, he's God. See that? So God is, uh, Jesus is sparking in his mind a, a thought process here, and he says the measurement of good. The second thing he talks about here in verse 19 is the measurement of sin. Look what he says. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, uh, and honor your father and mother. Jesus isn't saying here that if you do these, that you're going to have eternal life. He's not saying if you do these, you're going to have salvation. That's not what he's saying here. He's just showing him that he was a sinner. Because the Bible tells us that the law reveals we are sinful. Let me take you back to Romans chapter 8 and verse 30 for a second. Uh, the Bible tells us there, Paul writes, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If we didn't have the law, we wouldn't know we were wrong. Okay? And that's what Jesus is saying to him. Over in Romans, Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, Paul pretty much says the same thing again. He says, if it had not been for the law, this is what Paul says, if it had not, not been for the law, I would not have known I had sinned. And so the word of God and the law, of course, part of the word of God, shows us when we are sinful people. That's why people sometimes get a page of the Bible or a copy of the New Testament or something, and they're reading it, and all of a sudden, they come to Jesus. Every year when we have the Gideons here, they'll tell us a story about somebody who got saved, not by a message preached by Billy Graham, not by watching David Jeremiah on TV, not by being in a church service, but they were in a motel or they were someplace, and they opened a drawer, and there was a Bible, and they began to read it, and boom, they came to know Jesus. Because the Bible shows us that we are in need of a Savior. And then the Bible shows us who the Savior is. And so Jesus here is pointing out to him the measurement of sin. He said he's showing him what is wrong in his life. And then we go to the third part of this, and it's the measurement of his need. And so the Lord here goes for forward, and <clears throat> he says uh, in verse 20, uh, that the the uh, rich man, uh, the, the young ruler, whatever you want to call him, he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. How many of you think that was a true statement? That's good. I'm glad you didn't see. It's, it's in the Bible, so it's, it's, it's true in the Bible, but was he being honest? No, because can we? No, if we could, we didn't need a... We don't need Jesus. We don't need a Savior, okay? So the first thing I want you to notice about this guy and the measurement of his need was that he lacked the righteousness of God. He had righteousness, but it's called self-righteousness. And we all know that self-righteousness is nothing more than a lie from, from the devil. It's a lie from Satan because Satan convinces us that there is no reason why you can't go to heaven because... You know, you're a really good guy. You've never killed nobody. You've never raped nobody. You've never stolen. You've treated everybody well. You're a good guy. And that lie will take us right through the front gates of hell. The Bible says that Satan is the father of lies. And we need to keep in mind that when we hear these stupid voices in our head telling us to do stupid things, it's not God. God has never instructed you to do something outside of his word. God has never told you to do something outside of his own character. Don't get deceived by stupid thoughts coming in your head and, and voices that you think are from God. You need to line them up with Scripture. In fact, if you start in Acts where the church begins and read the rest of the book, all through every book there's a statement about false teachers because they are false teachers are servants of Satan. 
They're feeding the people a lie. And that lie can take them right to hell. The Bible tells us very clearly in Romans chapter 3 that there's none righteous, not one, not one. It also tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that we are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Our righteousness needs to come from God, it needs to come from Jesus. And so we lack the righteousness of God. The second measure of his need, he missed the love of the Savior. It's very interesting in verse 21, as we were reading along, sometimes you might miss these uh, simple little phrases in the text. It says, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. You might want to underline that in your Bible. Looked at him and he loved him. Jesus is God, amen? Jesus knows all things, amen? He already knew this guy was going to come right up to the point of surrendering his life and then walk away. He already knew that. And yet, look at the word. He loved him. That little statement, he loved him. You know, there's something here that you all should know if you don't already know. It doesn't matter how far away from God you get. It doesn't matter how much sin you get involved with. I'm not saying we should go and sin just for the fun of it because the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace abounds? And the answer is, no, we should not do that. But I want you to know that no matter what position you're in this morning spiritually, no matter how, you know, maybe your thought process is screwed up, maybe, maybe you know, you're, 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 you've, you've done things you shouldn't do and you know it, I want you to know Jesus loves you. He loves us all the time. Here's a guy that's going to go to hell unless something changes, and he's standing before the very one that can offer him eternal life. And that one is looking at him and doesn't say, get away from me because you're not going to surrender to, uh, to, to uh, right God's righteousness. Anyhow, go away. No, the very phrase is he loved him. He missed the love of the Savior. You know, one of the things we should always consider when we think about the cross is that Jesus loved me that much. That he died for me. He loved him. The third thing here about his need, he loved his money. He loved his money. I'm not sure if in our world today there's anything more dangerous than loving your junk and loving money. For an unsaved person, it will keep them from coming to Jesus because they strive towards that goal. And for a person who knows Jesus, the love of money the Bible says, can be the root of all evil. It can mess us up. We get so focused on our stuff. And in fact, if you want to, just change the word from money to stuff because we're really about stuff, are we not? we got to have stuff. And everybody in the room has got more stuff than you need. All you have to do is move, and you can find out how much stuff you don't need. My sister-in-law said everybody should move every five years. God forbid. <laughs> but I bet you we'd have a lot less stuff. Stuff we think we need, right? Amen? Stuff we love. And we're like, why did I save that? Anyway, he loved his stuff. Look what it says in verse 21. He said to him, you lack one thing. Jesus says, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. I want you to underline, sell all, give to the poor, come follow me. The reason I want you to underline those things in your Bible is because Jesus says you need to sell all. You need to give it to those who are in need. Then he says, come follow me. There's not one of those things. He didn't tell him to do one. He told him to do three things, all three. He cannot, he will not bow the knee to Christ. He will not come to Jesus as Savior until he gets rid of his stuff, because that's what he's worshiping. That's what he's worshiping. He loved his money. He loved his stuff more than he loved God. He broke the very first commandment. Exodus chapter 20 and verse uh, 3 tells us, you shall have no other gods before you. He broke the very first commandment. And, you know, one of the things that Israel repeated often was the Shema, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Let me read it to you. It says, Hear, O Israel, 
the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Here's a guy who has got it all going for him. He's young, he's wealthy, he's moral, he's religious. He's got power and position. And we end up down here at the end of verse 22. And the Lord says, the problem is you've got to get rid of the thing that you have put before me. And we don't find an argument from this rich young ruler. We don't find a discussion because I think he knew immediately that he had forgot the first commandment. I think he understood that he was not obedient to the very saying that they quoted over and over, the Shema, which says, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And the Bible says in verse uh, 22, that, uh, or, yeah, verse 22, disheartened by the saying, the words that Jesus says, he went away very sorrowful and look at the last sentence. For he had great possessions. Do you see that? See what happened? Here he is. Here he is. He has, he has come to a, an opportunity with Jesus. And he misses it. And he misses it because of stuff. He misses it because of, look at the end of verse 22. He had great possessions. Great possessions. You know, I believe the Lord allows us to have stuff for a purpose. As long as it is to honor and glorify him. But when our stuff becomes our God, that's a problem. That's a problem. So I want to finish this morning with four questions for us. Are we missing opportunities? This was a missed opportunity by a person who needed a savior. See, if you're going home today and your car breaks down and somebody stops and says, do you need help? And you're like, no, it's okay. There's a pretty good chance somebody else is going to come along. Amen. But when you turn away the savior of the world, he is the only way. He says very clearly, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And so when you look at him and you walk away and you want to worship other stuff, your great possessions, and you could even add to those the five things that we began with, his age and his power and his position and his wealth and his morals and his religious, uh, religious uh, beliefs. You got all that in there. That's all more important. And you missed the opportunity. Now, you're sitting here this morning. You're thinking, well, Pastor, I know Jesus as my Savior, so I haven't missed the opportunity. But the questions I'm going to ask you today are not about salvation alone. They're about our walk every day with Jesus. Because regardless of what you think, tomorrow morning, if the Lord tarries and he gives you another day, you're going to wake up. And you're going to face life again. And as you face life, you've got to make decisions every day, spiritual decisions about what you're going to do. Let me give you the first question. Do you have too much to be used by God? <laughs> as I was working on this message, and that question came to my mind, I'm thinking, holy cow, I got way more junk than I need. The other day, Abigail was down cellar with me. My, my office is supposed to be down cellar. It never got there because of the situation with Anna, but down cellar is all my books, and I got books and books and books and more books, and I got an office filled with books. And Abigail says, Grandpa Jim, why do you have so many books? And I thought to myself, maybe it's time to get rid of some of those books. Not in a dumpster but send them to the preachers that are in Africa who have nothing. Because do I have so much that I, I can't be used by God? Every time God calls me to do something, I'm falling over my junk. And I don't mean physically, I mean spiritually. 
So the Lord lays something on my heart, and I want to be obedient, but oh my goodness, I got this big pile of junk in the way. Do I have too much to be used by God? Do we have too much? Go back to the list that we gave of the man, okay? Do we have too much physically? We're young or we're good looking or whatever we are. Do we have too much money? Money is my drive. Money is my drive. I'm going to tell you, folks, I hope I'm wrong, but I believe that we're going to find something happen in the next six months in our country that is going to shock a lot of people. There are people that are not going to afford to heat their house this winter. There are people that are going to starve because they're heating their house but can't afford food. There are people that are not going to be able to afford their medicine. We are headed for a brick wall at a high rate of speed. And if we as Christians don't reach out and let God use us, what kind of testimony are we? Do I have more than I need? How about the skills God has given you? The ability to do things. Are you using that for Jesus or is it all about you? You just want to make sure that when you're all finished and done and, and you put the write-up in the paper, you make sure they put in there all this stuff that you did, but none of it has anything to do with Jesus. Hmm. Is all this stuff that we are comfortable with, go back to point number one, is all that stuff that we talked about this man, is that in our lives? And is that keeping us from being useful for God? Would you even know if God was talking to you? You got so much stuff, you can't hear him. The noise is too loud. Number two, are you spiritual enough to be dangerous? Are you spiritual enough to be dangerous? You say, that doesn't even make much sense. <laughs> We talk spirituality, we talk religiously, we talk righteously maybe, but we don't have Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, you know all the Bible verses you learned in elementary school or in a Good News Club or in VBS or whatever, but you know down in your heart you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. Your parents said you were saved because you got baptized or, or grandma said you were saved because somewhere along the line you prayed some prayer, but really, truthfully, you don't know Jesus and you know you don't know Jesus. You're just spiritual enough to be dangerous, dangerous to yourself. Or how about are you spiritual enough to be dangerous to others? You tell people you're a Christian, but what about your life would show Christ? You, you tell people, you know, you wear the shirt or maybe you got a bumper sticker on your car, uh, but God can't use you because you're just spiritual enough to be dangerous. You got family that are lost and headed to hell, and yet there's nothing in your life that shows them anything different than what they already have. You know, you go down the road, and, and you want everybody to know that you're, you know, I'm born again, but you, you drive like a maniac, you act like a maniac. And, and when somebody uh, does something to you, you scream and yell and blow the horn. And, and then when they pass you there in the bumper stickers, uh, that love, uh, Jesus loves you. Really? Hmm. Are we spiritual enough to be dangerous? I'm going to be honest this morning. Most, bo most people that are born again aren't spiritual at all. They have not got in the word of God. They can't tell you the last time they read a Bible, short of being in a service. They spend no time in prayer, but they're the ones that call up and want prayer. They want us to pray for their lost loved one. They want us to, to pray for their sick. They, okay, uh, they, they may be born again, but they have no relation, no deep relationship with God at all. They're just spiritually dangerous to themselves and to other people. To other people. All of you people that have Facebook, I want you to look at what you post on Facebook. What's it say? Do you ever put anything on there about Jesus? I had a friend call me three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and said to me, I have been convicted. I put a lot of stuff on about politics. I put a lot of stuff on about this and about that. I don't put nothing on about Jesus. Every day now, all I keep showing up on his Facebook page is all this stuff about Jesus. I'm like, hallelujah. 
that has way more value than whether some sport team won a game or some person got drafted or whatever, some person made the Emmys or whatever those things are they have. I don't even pay attention to all that stuff. So are we spiritual enough to be dangerous? Number three, are we in love with Jesus or are we in love with ourselves? If Jesus told you to do something radical today, would you have to run it through your mental system to see if it fit in line with your own thought process, or would you just go do it? You just do it. When we're in love with Jesus, and he says run, we run. When he says walk, we walk. When he says wait, we wait. And guess what we don't do? We don't mumble. We don't complain. We just do what he tells us. But when we are in love with ourselves, we want Jesus' program to fit into our plan. One of the great travesties of the, of the present day church is that we are trying every day as churches all across the world to come up with a format and a plan on how we can do what God wants us to do. How about stopping that crap, excuse me, and just do what God wants us to do? If God tells us to do something, don't you think that plan's better? So why are we trying to come up with, I get every day, I get emails and I get, I get stuff sent to me, how to do this in your church and how to do that in your church. I just want to be Jesus to a world that needs Jesus. And that's what we need to be is Jesus to a world that needs to be Jesus. Forget all the stupid stuff. Guess what it's done for us so far? Nothing. We need to be in love with Jesus, not in love with ourselves. So you say, well, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. Let me ask you one more question that tags that question. Let's wait right with that question. The four things, the four T's I talk about, time, talent, treasure, and testimony. How does your time line up with God? How does your treasure line up with God? How does your testimony, who do you talk about? Does it line up with God? How does your talent, what God has gifted you to use, are you using it for God? Number four, are we born again from above or below? What do I mean by that? Born again from above goes along with our music today. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are redeemed because of Jesus. Amen? Born again from below is we have bought into the lie of the evil one, that we are okay and what the Bible says doesn't really count. After all, the Bible's an old book and it's written by a bunch of different people and it doesn't make any sense and I can't understand it. And so, are you born again by the blood of Christ or are you born again in your own thought process that you are okay? Because I got to tell you, the, the hell is going to be full of okay people. People who thought they were okay only to find out that they're lost. See, we need to today, I want all of us to evaluate ourselves and ask a very simple question. If I died right now, where am I going to be in one second and why? And if you say, well, if I died right now, I'm going to be with Jesus, why? And if you don't know the answer, today's the day to come to Christ. Today. I don't want you to know it because you've learned it in VBS or you've learned it at Child Evangelism Fellowship or you've learned it from the pre preacher preaching. I want you to say, when I die, I'm going to be with Jesus because in my heart, there is a connection between me and Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. I have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. If you can't say that this morning, don't walk out that door without knowing Jesus. When I was in college, they used to have guys come, pastors come and do chapel. We had chapel three times a week. And we used to, uh, these guys would come speak. And i never forget, there was one guy, I can't tell you his name, I don't remember his name, but his message at the end of it, he told this little story. And it's been a story that I have never forgotten. But he pastored outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And... One night they were having service, and at the end of the service they had an invitation for people to come forward and, and to accept Christ. 
and there were some people that came, but there was a guy that he had never seen before sitting on the back row in the church, and, and he saw him, and like his eyes locked on this guy who was standing, sitting there all by himself. And, and so this pastor said that he felt inside of him that God was telling him to go back and talk to that guy. But he argued with God because he's the pastor. He should be up front. And he did this little battle with God. And Oh, by the way, you can't fight God. You always lose. God has a terrific knockout punch, doesn't he? And finally, after arguing with God, and he sang 49 verses of, how, uh, of uh, Have I Known Way, he decided he needed to go back. And so he left the pulpit, and he went back. And he walks up to this guy, and he said, God told me to come back here and talk to you. And the guy said, I, I don't want to hear it. And so he walked back up front. And he said he no more than got up there, and he felt the Lord saying, go back there and tell him, Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you need to come to Jesus. And so he goes back there again to talk to him. And the guy's like, you know, I don't even know why I'm here. And I don't want to hear this. And, and, and I don't believe in God. He's just like, he don't want to hear it. And so the pastor came back. He said, by the time he got to the front of the church, God was, this is verse 48, by the way, of have I no way. God told him to go back the third time. And he went back the third time and he said, as clearly as I can tell you, God has told me that I need to come back and show you how to know Jesus as your Savior. The guy turned and walked out of the church. Service ended. It was a, it was a night service. Service ended. They were going home. Just down the road a little ways, there was an accident. The guy was killed in a car accident. The preacher stopped. He wasn't going to, but he felt God saying stop. So he stopped and he walked over and there was the guy. He was dead. You know, folks, I'm not telling you that this morning is scary. I'm telling you that this morning that none of you in this room know how long you're going to live. And if you don't know Jesus today as your personal Savior, would you take and put a gun up to your head and play Russian roulette? And most of us, I hope, would say no. And why do that with our life? We need Jesus. Today he's calling us. And we can come to him. I think people are just full of people. I think churches, I mean, are full of people just like this guy in this story this morning. Not the guy from Atlanta, but the guy right here. They're spiritual in their own eyes. They're self-righteous. They've done a lot of good stuff. They have a lot of stuff to prove how valuable they are, but they don't know Jesus. I think churches all over America today, if the rapture happens, they're going to go right on and have service. Because people who think they're saved, but they aren't. They hear the gospel. Some churches preach the gospel and they hear it and they walk away week after week after week after week because the evil one sits in the seat next to them and whispers in their ear. And he lies to them and he tells them, you don't need that. Don't miss the opportunity today, folks. If you're born again, Get busy for Jesus because he's coming back and you will be accountable before him. If you're not born again today, come to Jesus. Come to him. I'm going to pray. Rich is going to come and play. As he plays, I want us just to sit still today. I want us to bow our heads. I want us to evaluate our relationship with God. And if you say, Pastor, I need to know Jesus. I want you to step up out of your seat, and I want you to walk right up here to me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to introduce you to the greatest thing that has ever happened in my life. Jesus saves.